So now that we've introduced that organisms are going to have different cleavage patterns depending on their yolk presence, let's continue our discussion on cleavage patterns by entitling the next flowchart Cleavage Patterns 2. And we'll continue our look at the frog and how it develops its embryo. So frog continued will be the subtitle. So now what we have to sort of first look at are the first two divisions, the first two moments of cleavage within this developing frog embryo. Now that we have a good working knowledge of what we're dealing with, we're dealing with asymmetric cleavage and holoblastic cleavage, something's got to give. So let's take a look. So what we're going to state is that the first two cleavage furrows, the first two results of cytokinesis, therefore, are going to form in an orientation that is parallel to a structure or an imaginary structure called the meridian, parallel to the meridian. When we say meridian, think of an imaginary line that connects the poles. If we have, let's say, a developing embryo, we have an animal pole on one side and we have a vegetal pole on the other, we're going to have a meridian, a line that connects them. And we're going to have two cleavage furrows form parallel to the meridian. So there's going to be one that forms sort of here and one that forms sort of here. And that's going to then have a result on what happens. So here we're going to first state that the first cleavage, the very first cleavage, the very first division, furrow will still be trying to, let's write this down, first cleavage furrow will still be trying to do what? It will still be trying to divide the yolky cytoplasm, to divide the yolky, if that's a word, cytoplasm, even though the second division has begun. So there's a lot of words here, give me a second. Even though second division has already begun. Okay, let's reread this. The first cleavage furrow will still be trying to divide the yolky cytoplasm even though the second division has already begun. So what we're seeing here is that when we create the first cleavage furrow, we're basically going to have this struggle of one side dividing better than the other side. What side do you think is going to be dividing in a better, sort of faster route? The whole point of cleavage is rapid mitotic division. So the side that is the animal side, the animal pole that contains no yolk, basically, everything here is going to divide fast and quickly, whereas everything on the other side, the vegetal pole, is going to be taking more time, and so much time that it's still going to be trying to divide its first moment when the other side is already at its second moment. That's basically what we're saying in this first point. Okay, big deal. What is the consequence of this? Well, overall, what we'll notice is that after the first two cleavage furrows form, we're going to end with, or sort of complete and result in, four blastomeres. That's because we went from one zygote to two cells of a developing embryo, and then we did another cleavage event, which gave us four. Okay, so we did one cleavage, two cleavage, that's going to be two cleavage furrows that formed, four blastomeres are going to result. Blastomeres are the specific results of a cleavage. So, four blastomeres are produced, these four blastomeres, for right now, even though we had this sort of lapse here, are going to be relatively equal size, um, and they're going to be from the animal to the vegetal pole. From animal to vegetal pole. So this uh, sort of lapse that we have here will sort of catch up and result in four blastomeres that are relatively equal in size. And overall, after this also, we will form something called the gray crescent. A gray crescent forms. The gray crescent is a structure that has a lighter color to it. It's a lighter colored region. Lighter colored region of this developing embryo and it's opposite side of the sperm entry. It's found on the opposite side of the sperm entry. Opposite side of sperm entry. 
Okay, so this is just another structure that forms as a result of these first two cleavages. This structure is mentioned and defined for a reason, and that's because this is going to be where gastrulation begins. This is the point of ga gastrulation. Um, gastrulation begins here. And remember, gastrulation is just that sort of pushing in of this embryo to form the gastrula, that cavity. Um, that's something we'll talk about more in development too, but just know that these specific events happen. All of these events are hard to imagine, I understand, so take a look at the figure. The figure 47.7 does a good job of showing this in a visualized way that's better than what I did over here. So, big deal. First two cleavage for us doesn't seem like much has happened in terms of the yolk and the cleavage patterns. What's the big difference? When do we see this huge sort of consequence of yolk? That's going to actually be seen in the third division. So let's take a look. Once we get to the third division, on our way from going to four to eight, right? This is our third division right here. This is going to be a big moment because this is going to cause a bit of differences. This is when we explicitly state that the yolk itself begins to affect the size of the cells. Begins to affect size of cells at the two poles. At two poles. So now this is when we say something's got to give eventually. So what we state here is that the equatorial plane is going to develop. Let's first define this. There's going to be something called an equatorial plane, which is like this, this solid line that I'm drawing here, up top here. This is an equatorial plane. Think of it as like an equator. That's an imaginary line, just like the meridian is an imaginary line. The equatorial plane is a line that's perpendicular, just like I drew there, to the meridian. There's a reason we're mentioning this right now. Um, this is because it will be mentioned in just a second in terms of the context, why we need to know about the equatorial plane. So just know that that's a structure, an imaginary structure to keep in mind. What's going to happen is that after the third division, as we've written above here, we've made how many blastomeres? Eight, right? We've doubled. We double every time. So we produce an eight-cell embryo. It's a still very much developing embryo. And upon this production, we're going to have the following sort of consequences of the yolk. So what we state is that the yolk that is near the vegetal pole, because that's why it's called a vegetal pole, it's, there's yolk there, so yolk near vegetal pole actually displaces something known as the mitotic apparatus. So if you remember, in order to do mitosis, you needed to form those centrosomes and mitotic spindles, and those mitotic spindles would go to one pole and the other pole and equally separate chromosomes and equally divide the cell. Look what we're doing here. We're displacing something that promotes an equal division, the mitotic apparatus. We're causing that mitotic apparatus to be pushed somewhere. This vegetal pole which is full of yolk, let's say, is pushing this structure, like this, let's say this square is the mitotic apparatus, it's pushing it forward, it's pushing it upwards, because it's yolk, it's thick, it's in the way, and it's pushing it towards something. Where do you think it's pushing it upwards toward? The animal pole. It's moving this mitotic apparatus to the animal pole. That would mean that this thing that's in charge of dividing the cell is going to cause the following event. Thus, the cleavage furrow, which is just an indentation as a result of cytokinesis, will go to the animal pole. So there should have been an equal cleavage furrow on both sides of this growing embryo, but right now the cleavage furrow has moved to the animal pole entirely. So now what you create as a result of this are two, technically what we call them are tiers of blastomeres. Two sort of groups of blastomeres and those two blastomeres are going to be those that are at the vegetal hemisphere uh, below this equatorial plane that I drew here and those that are above at the animal structure. What we notice is that one tier, one of them, the ones that are at the animal flow will have blastomeres that are smaller. They are smaller at the animal at the animal, I should say, pole slash hemisphere. Both are the same thing in this context. Why is that? Because these are undergoing more divisions. Why are the blastomeres here undergoing more divisions? Why are the ones here 
that I'm coloring in undergoing more divisions? Well, first of all, they have a mitotic apparatus, a second one. They have no yolk in the sort of way, and they're going to just divide a lot better and a lot more in order to now have an asymmetric cleavage. The vegetal side will still have some division, but trust me, that division will be slow, and it will not be the same as the animal divisions, the animal pole divisions, and thus we have unequal and asymmetric cleavages within the frog. Overall, what we notice is that after the first two and the third, let's call them the subsequent divisions to sort of conclude our look at frog development, the subsequent divisions. Here we notice that the yolk itself still continues to be this bothersome, not bothersome, but this yolk which provides nutrients, great, whatever, still is in the way. It continues to push cleavage, thus push divisions, thus increase divisions, push cleavage towards the animal pole, towards animal pole. Now you might know why it's called the animal pole. This is really essentially where the animal will develop, whereas the vegetal pole, vegetal means not living. That's the non-living side, and thus we're going to have more of the development at the animal pole, specifically of the animal. Finally, Overall consequence is that the blastocele itself, that empty cavity we've talked about before, that structure forms entirely and completely at this side. Forms completely at animal hemisphere. Why is that? Well, first of all, the blastocele should be a central cavity, but it's not going to be central. It's going to form only at this half of the developing frog embryo. And that covers our look at the frog cleavage patterns. We're going to, in the next video, conclude our look at cleavage patterns by talking about uh, echinodermatas. We're going to talk about birds and um, just overall complete our understanding of the differences in the presence of yolk and how it affects cleavage.